um, Mapungubia Institute for Strategic Reflection annual lecture. A special word of welcome to our uh, guest of honor, uh, Professor Justin Lin, whom I will introduce uh, shortly. Um, at this stage, I would like to make a few acknowledgements of the people who are in attendance. Uh, we do have uh, Professor Justin Lin, who has joined us to give us the main uh, lecture for today. We also have with us uh, two um, respondents, that is uh, Dr. Pilani, um, as well as uh, Pilani Mtembu, as well as uh, Professor Fiona Trajena. Uh, I would like to acknowledge from Mistra's side, uh, on behalf of the Mistra Council, the council is led by the chairperson, Mr. Oyama Mabanja. Uh, we also have the board of governors, uh, which is led by Professor Vilin Komo uh, in attendance today. And of course, the rest of the Mistra family, uh, the staff and um, fellowships led by the executive director, Mr. Joel Nechitenje. I also would like to acknowledge the University of Johannesburg, which has partnered with us for this lecture, as well as the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences that has also partnered with us for this lecture. I acknowledge, of course, the most important people for this lecture today is yourselves, esteemed guests and participants from all walks of life here in South Africa and abroad. Um, Mistra is 10 years old uh, today, and for me, it is a, a, an honorable thing to be the program, program director because I was there right from the beginning. I was the program director for the inaugural Mistra uh, annual lecture in 2012, and to be asked to take uh, part in this uh, inaugural, I mean, in this 10th year anniversary lecture. It's also a special moment for me. Um, Mistra has stood the test of time. 10 years is not a small feat for a think tank, especially in South Africa. And so we would like to say congratulations to Mistra for that. In the space of these 10 years, Mistra has produced uh, 27 books. It has hosted, and this is the 10th lecture, annual lectures that has um, really shed light on issues of academic and intellectual discourse. It has commissioned quite a number of um, research reports that have assisted a lot of institutions, but has been able to achieve all of this because of uh, partnerships that it has had with several research bodies as well as universities. And we would like to take um, this opportunity to say thank you to our partners and all the fellows of Mistra that have been part of this um, institute for the last 10 years. Today's topic for our annual lecture is China's new development paradigm within the great global changes unseen in a century. And this will be, of course, um, delivered by none other than Professor Justin Lin, whom we are very thankful that he has agreed to um, present this lecture and share with us his work that he has had over the years. He has been focusing on uh, this kind of discourse over the years. And just by way of introduction, uh, Professor Justin Lin is Dean of Institute of New Structural Economics, Dean of Institute of South to South Cooperation and Development, and Professor and Honorary Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University. He was a Senior Vice President and Chief Economics at the World Bank 2008 to 2012. Prior to this, Professor Lin served for 15 years as Founding Director and Professor of the China Center for Economic Research at Peking University. He is a Counselor of the State Council and a member of the Standing Committee Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. He is the author of more than 20 books, including Beating the Odds, Jumpstarting Developing Countries, Going Beyond Aid, Development Cooperation for Structural Transformation, 
the quest for prosperity, how developing economics can how developing economies can take off, as well as new structural economics, a framework for rethinking development and policy against the consensus. And lastly, reflections on the Great Recession and demystifying the Chinese economy. He is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Academy of Sciences for Developing World. So it is quite clear that he is well accomplished in his uh, academic and intellectual career and journey. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin, for agreeing to come and share with us your insights on this very important topic, China's new development paradigm within the great global challenges unseen in a century. China, we all know, has been distinguished or has distinguished itself in terms of setting long-term agendas and following up mm -hmm. on them in terms of execution. Now, MISTRA has framed itself as an institute for long-term strategic reflection. Um, and therefore, I think this is befitting to look at China and what we can anticipate within a century in terms of its participation in the global <clears throat> space. South Africa, of course, comes into this discussion with um, keen interest. We are a member of BRICS, which also includes China. In terms of the geopolitical positioning of South Africa, we are equidistant between Asia and the Americas. And of course, we hold bilateral relations with both China and America. I'm raising this in the context of China having grown to become one of the great economic leader globally to the extent of there being a phenomenon that has arisen of a so-called rivalry between the United States of America and China. And I'm hoping that in this lecture today, we are going to see, of course, from the prism of China, uh, what this implicates in terms of this so-called rivalry between the great world economic powerhouses. Without any further ado, <clears throat> Let me then hand over to Professor Lin and just state that after he has spoken, he will be followed by uh, Dr. Pilanim Tembu as a respondent, as well as Professor Fiona Tregena. After that, we will open up for discussions whereby we will invite uh, participants to ask questions or make inputs. Uh, Professor Justin Lin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to give this prestigious annual lecture, especially at its 10th anniversary. In my lecture, I'll cover three main themes. The great global changes unseen in a century, the China's new development paradigm, and also the prospect for China's future growth. The great global change unseen in a century is a proposition advanced by President Xi Jinping in 2018. As economy is the basis of the power. So we can see the change from the change in the global economic architecture in the past century. In 1900, there were eight powers alliance force invading China. And those eight powers were United Kingdom, United States, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, Japan, and uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were the industrialized power at the time. Their combined GDP measured by purchasing power parity was 50.4% of the global GDP, about half of the global GDP. In 2000, 
there was a group of eight. And uh, they were United States, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, Russia, Japan. The first seven were exactly the same as the fourth seven uh, power alliance in 1900. And the last one was Canada. And as you know, it was because Austria-Hungarian Empire collapsed after the First World War and it was replaced by the rising power of Canada. They are from the G8 because their combined GDP was 47% of the global GDP. So we can see in the 20s, first in the 20th century, those eight powers in terms of their economic position in the world were very stable. It only changed from 50.4% to 47%. And uh, because economy is the basis of power. So throughout the 20th century, the world was in peace or in war, basically depending on the relations between those eight countries. And uh, <clears throat> in 2018, when President Xi Jinping proposed the great changes unseen in a century, the G8 GDP decline to be the 34.7% of the world, a little bit over the one third. Because of the declining power, uh, economic position, the G8 lost its ability to lead the global affairs. And uh, it's demonstrated in 2008, when the world was hit by the global financial crisis, the G8 was replaced by the G20. Currently, the G20 is the leading global group in shaping the global affair and replacing the position of the G8. Why the G8? It loses its economic position from 47% in 2000 down to 34 34.7% in 2018. I think it was because of the rising BRICS, especially China, in, you know, after the, you know, those period of time. In 2000, China's economic weight in the world was 6.9%. And uh, in 2018, China's weight was 16.9%. 8%. China advanced 9.9% in the world, and the G8 lost 12.3% in the world. So that means about 80%, 80% of the loss of the G8 was due to the rise of China. And the US was the superpower in the whole periods of the 20th century and felt the biggest loss because in 2014, China's GDP measured by purchasing popularity overtook the US as the largest economy in the world. And as I mentioned, economy is the basis of power. So US started to adopt policy, try to mitigate China's further growth. And during the Obama administration, they adopted so-called pivoting to Asian Pacific. That means they tried to deploy its Navy forces from Mediterranean to the Asian Pacific in order to encircle China militarily. And during the Trump administration, they started the trade war with China and tried to 
forced the world to decouple from China. And uh, now the Biden administration continue this strategy, try to isolate China. And the tension between the largest economy of China and the US, certainly aiding the uncertainty to the world and it threaten the stability and the causing you know, tension in the whole world. And when will this kind of situation be over? I think it depends on the further development of China. Currently, the per capita GDP of China is around 25% of the US. If China can further growth, reaching 50% of the GDP of the US, I think the situation will be over because the population size in China is four times of the US. If the per capita GDP in China was half of the US, that means the economic size in China will be twice as large as the US. And I think US cannot do anything to change it. And secondly, certainly there are some kind of regional disparity in China. And the more advanced regions, including Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and the five coastal provinces in China, their combined population is a little bit over 400 million. And their per capita GDP you know, will be around the same as the US. And the US population currently is about 340 million. Certainly they continue to grow and they may reach around 400 million. And uh, this two part, this part of China will be as large as the US. And more importantly, the same per capita GDP means the same productivity level, the same technology and industrial level. So by that time, the US will not have the superiority of technology over China. And the third, because trade is win-win and a smaller economy will gain more from the trade. So by that time, the US trade with China, US will benefit more for the US companies and its economic development, they cannot do without China. So by that time, I think that the relation between China and the US will be improved and the tension will be over. And uh, as the largest economy and the second largest economy in the world, they can maintain peace and a, and a friendly relation. It will become the foundation for the peace in the world. So the way out for this, you know, and uh, uh, for this, you know, uh, great changes in the world is to have a further development in China. Then about the new development paradigm. It's a policy proposed by President Xi Jinping in 2020. In and this new development paradigm, the exact meaning is that to have the domestic circulation is the main state of the Chinese economy. And using the domestic circulation and overseas circulation to reinforce each other. In the past, Chinese economic policy was perceived as export-oriented strategies. And why President Xi Jinping proposed to make the domestic circulation as the main state of the Chinese economy, it seemed to deviate from the previous policy orientation. I think there are several reasons. The first reason certainly related to the pandemic and the global trade was interrupted. And the second is because the US policy to decouple from China. And certainly China will have to rely more on the domestic economy for the further growth. But I think more important was underlining economic forces. Although in the past, China was perceived as an economy with export-oriented development strategies, but trade as a percentage of the Chinese GDP was highest 
in 2006. At that time, 35.4% of China's GDP was used for export. By the time of 2019, one year ahead of President Xi's new proposal, trade declined to about 17.4% of China's GDP. So during those 13 years, trade as a percentage of GDP already reduced, you know, 50%. And uh, in 2019, already 82.6% of China's production was consumed in domestic economy. So even before the proposal, already the domestic circulation was the main state of the China's economy. And I think there are two main reasons for this change in the weight of trade of Expo in the Chinese economy. The first one is economic size. We know that modern manufacturing has a large economy of scale. And the larger the economy, then the larger proportion of the manufacturing can be consumed in domestic economy. And then secondly, it's the weight of services. We know that services, many of the activities are non-tradable. So the larger trade of services in an economy, then the less export of the economy will be. And we can see uh, from these two forces. In 2006, China's GDP was 5.3% of the global GDP. By the time of 2019, China's GDP contributed to 16.4% of the global GDP. It's tripled. And also, service in 2006 was 41.8% of China's GDP. And by the time of 2019, service was 53.6% of China's GDP. So because of rising size of China's economy and the increasing weight of the services in China's economy, so Expo reduced from 35.4% in 2006 down to 17.4% of China's GDP in 2019. And uh, certainly China's economy will continue to rise. And that means the export as a percentage of GDP or domestic consumption as a percentage of GDP will continue to change. And uh, the domestic regulation will change from currently about 82% up to 85, up to 90% of China's GDP. So certainly the domestic circulation will continue and will strengthening as the main state of the Chinese GDP. If this is a basic economic forces, why President Xi make this new statement? I think that to understand China is the largest economy and the domestic relation is the mainstay of the economy will enhance people's confidence of the Chinese capital growth because Chinese, China is a large economy, just like uh, big air carriers. No matter what kind of storm in the world, as long as we can do our domestic things right, we can maintain stability and uh, continue growth. And uh, even though the domestic circulation is an immense state, does not mean trade is not important. No, actually export and uh, trade is as important as in the past. Because if you want to increase the domestic circulation in the GDP, we need to increase the GDP. We need to have further growth. The best way for growth, according to the new structural economics I propose, is to follow a country's competitive advantages in the process of its development. For sectors, the country has competitive advantages. Certainly, China should you know, develop that. And since it's China's competitive advantages, those goods will be sold domestically and they can also export to the global 
economy, global markets. Even though China is a large economy, but compared to the global economy, China is still relatively small. For example, in 2019, Chinese domestic GDP, Chinese GDP was only 16% of global GDP. So that means there were 84% of the market outside in the world. It's about five times of the Chinese economic size. So for those sectors that China has competitive advantages, China should you know, develop those kind of sectors and uh, also export the product to a much larger global market in order to realize the economy of scales. And uh, for those sectors which China does not have competitive advantages, certainly China will have to rely on import in order to reduce the cost of the production and the cost of living. And there are many areas that China does not have competitive advantages. One is natural resources. China will continue to import natural resources, mineral products, and so on from the global markets. And the second one is some kind of capital intensive high tech sectors, which are the competitive advantage of the advanced countries. And uh, it would be much better to import those kind of products and technology because the cost of production domestically will be much higher than import. Then the third one is the labor intensive sectors. In the past, certainly China was very competitive in the labor intensive manufacturing sectors. But because of rising economy and the increase in the wages of the China's labor force, China is losing competitive advantages in labor intensive manufacturing. And China will increasingly to rely on the import of the, you know, uh, 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 of the products. And so that's the reason why in the, new, in the you know, new development paradigm, the first part is to have the domestic circulation as the main state of the Chinese economy. And it's just a reflection of the reality in China. And the second one is to use domestic circulation and overseas circulation to reinforce Chinese you know, development. And that is the way China will develop the Chinese economy. China will develop a sector which China has complete advantages and to export and also to use the large domestic economy uh, as a market for the global economy. And so China can you know, develop in a way which not only benefit China, but also benefit the global economy. And sir, part of me, and I'll discuss the prospect of the Chinese future growth. Because as I mentioned, the way out for a stable global uh, 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 architecture is to have a further development in China. So China can increase its income up to 50% of the US per capita GDP. And uh, if China want to make the you know, domestic circulation bigger, China also need to have further development of the Chinese economy. And the issue is that will China be able to maintain dynamic economic growth in the future? As you know that China started the transition from a planned economy to a market economy in 1978. And from 1978 to last year, 2021, the average annual growth rate in China was 9.2 percent. You know, we never, you know, observed such a high growth rate to be achieved in a large country like China for such a long time. You know, it can be called as a miracle in the human history. But the issue is that whether China will be able to, you know, achieve high growth continuously in the coming years. There are certainly a lot of discussion about that. And for me, if you want to make a judgment, whether China will be able to achieve high growth in the coming years, we need to understand what is the main reason for China to achieve such an outstanding growth rate in the past four decades. I think the most important reason 
Certainly, it's continuous technological innovation and industrial upgrading. And uh, it's the basic mechanism for any country, including the high income country to maintain its growth or a developing country to, man to maintain its growth. But for the advanced country, if they want to maintain their growth or technological innovation and industrial upgrading, since they have high income, means they have high level productivity, their technology and their industry are already on the global frontiers. So that's the reason why they, or they are the highest income country in the world. And if they want to have a technological innovation and industrial grading, they will have to invent the new technology and the new industries. And we know invention is very risky. And, and if you are successful, certainly you can have a you know, patent protected by patent and you can have the global markets and you will be very profitable. However, it's very risky. And for the advanced country, since the you know, early and late 19th century up to now, their average annual growth rate was around 3%. Their increase in particular GDP was about 2% per year, and then you know, plus their population growth rate. So for the advanced country, their annual growth rate is around 3%. But how come China was able to achieve 9.2% continuously for the past 40 years? I, I think it's a, the main reason was the late commercial advantages. As a developing country, China is on a catching up process. And during this catching up process, China can rely on importation of technology valuing of technology as a way for the technological innovation and uh, you know, industrial upgrading. And that allowed China to achieve 9.2% growth in the past four decades. And the issue is how large of the room for further development by relying on these late commerce advantages. And we can compare historical experiences. In 2019, According to the Pennsylvania War Table, the, in 2019, the per capita GDP in China, measured by purchasing power parity, was 22.6%, 22.6% of the US in the same years. It was similar to Germany in 1946. At that time, Germany per capita GDP was about 22, 23% of the US. It was similar to Japan in 1956 and Korea in 1985. For these three economies, when their per capita GDP was around 22 to 23% of the US, they maintained 16 years of, you know, over 9% growth. For Germany, from 1946 to 1962, its annual growth rate was 9.4%. And the per GDP growth rate was 8.6%, 8.6%. And for Germany, uh, for, for Japan, from 1956 to 1972, its annual growth rate was 9.6%, and with population growth rate of 1% its per capita GDP growth rate was 8.6%. And for Korea, from 1955 to 2001, its annual growth rate was 9%, with a population growth rate of 0.9%. So its annual GDP growth rate per person was 8.1%. So from this, we can see by relying on the late commerce advantages, China should have the growth potential of 8% from 2019 to 2035. And compared to Germany, Japan, and Korea, there are one more advantage for China. That is the so-called the new economy, the big data and artificial intelligence. For this new economy, there are some features 
which benefit China. That is, the innovation cycle of the new technology is very short. 12 months, six months will be a new generation of technology. And the main input is human capital. And as you know, China has 1.4 billion population. Certainly China has abundant human capitals. And not only so, China has a big domestic market. And uh, if there's some you know, new technology require hardware, China has the most complete manufacturing business in the whole world. So considering the late comments advantages and uh, the, you know, new, the advantages in new economy, I think from now to 2035, China should enjoy a growth potential of 8% per year. Certainly growth potential only you know, see the possibility from the supply side, and we need to take care about the, you know, the situation, the demand side and the global economy. But I think it should be possible for China to maintain around 6% real growth from now to 2035. By similar analysis, I think that China from 2036 to 2049 will have around 6% growth potential. And uh, to realize around 4% annual growth from 2036 to 2049, the years of centennial anniversary of the foundings of the People's Republic of China. And if China can maintain the growth rate of around 6% up to 2035 and around 4% up to 2049, then by the time you forget the GDP of China will be around 50% of the US. And the calculation is based on this. In 2019, the US, the China per capita GDP was 22.6% of the US. And if China wanted to you know, raise from 22.6% up to 50% of the US, the per capita GDP growth rate in China should be 2.7% higher than the US per capita GDP growth. And the US per capita GDP growth in the past 50 years was 1.8%. So, one, and I think the US were likely to maintain that kind of growth rate. And if China can have the GDP per growth rate 2.7% higher than the US, that means the average annual growth rate in China from 2019 to 2049 will have to be. 4.5% per year. And if China can grow around 6% before 2035 and around 4% before 2049, China will be able to achieve that growth target. So by the time of the 2049, most likely China's per capita GDP will reach 50% of the US per capita GDP. And as I mentioned, China's population size is four times of the US. So by the time, China will be around twice as large as the US. And uh, China advanced regions, their per capita GDP, their technological level will be around the same as the US. And uh, the, 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 the US economy, you know, the US companies, they will see the benefit of the trade with China, the necessity of the trade with China to maintain its position in the global economy. So by that time, I think that not only China will realize its dream of national reachable nation, and also I think the world will reach a point that we can enjoy the stability and the peace. So let me conclude. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world, but I think one thing will be certain. China will maintain stability and dynamic economic growth in the coming years. And as you know, since 2008, China contributed about 30% to the global growth. I think China will continue to
to make similar contribution to the global growth in the coming decades. And China's growth will not only benefit China. To realize its dream of national rejuvenation, China will continue to open its economy and China's growth will continue to be the driving force for the growth in other nations in the world. And China will contribute to the global peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, you have given us quite a lot to reflect on. And, and indeed, we thank you for the way in which you have mapped um, the information that you have given us, starting right uh, from the beginning to demonstrate that um, the, the whole situation of the domination or rather the influence over the global economy is not something new. It spans quite a long time ago into centuries. But most important is your assertion that the economy is the backbone of power. And therefore uh, we have to understand the context of uh, China's concern and, uh, and, and, and plan for growth in this regard. What is amazing for me is how um, in abbreviation, the new development paradigm is similar to the new development plan in South Africa, it's all NDP, but you are able to summarize what it is in just a word uh, to actually say that it is concerned with domestic circulation as the mainstay of the Chinese economy. I wonder if I was challenged to uh, summarize in a word what the NDP for South Africa is, I will be able to do so in such a very succinct way. But um, it's quite important, the number of uh, inputs that you have given, I'm not going to attempt to regurgitate what you have said. We've got very able, uh, respondents with us that are going to um, comment on what you have said and hopefully they will also um, uh, comment on what this means for South Africa because of course we're not interested in China's uh, economic growth and global positioning economically for the sake of it. We want to understand our own implication as a country. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to invite our respondents I did note that I made the mistake of not introducing myself um, to the participants. I am uh, Dr. Chilizira Shitanga. I'm one of the board members of MISTRA and uh, directing the program for you today. Um, without any further waste of time, I will therefore uh, call upon uh, Dr. Pilanim Tembu, who is the executive director uh, at the Institute for Global Dialogue to give us a few uh, remarks in response to the lecture that we have received from Professor Lin. I must also hasten to say that the lecture is immediately available on the YouTube um, uh, platform called Mistra South Africa for, for, for those who want to look at it again. Um, Dr. Mtembu, the platform is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajitanga, and uh, thank you, Professor Lin, um, for that uh, lecture. And I think <clears throat> starting uh, you know, from the basis of what Dr. Rajitanga was saying is that I think what uh, Professor Lin uh, sort of outlines here is the importance of planning, um, the importance of long-term planning, but also the ability to break down a long-term plan into shorter periods um, to outline the type of interventions that need to actually take place, but also to be more specific than that and to actually highlight which are the actors that need to intervene or that need to take particular actions in order to achieve that long-term uh, objective. <clears throat> and I think in South Africa, what we are grappling with, uh, we are speaking a lot about the professionalization of the state. We are speaking a lot about building a state capacity. Uh, we speak a lot about having good policies, but not having the capability uh, to actually implement. Uh, those And I think if there's definitely something that we can sharpen in terms of our own interventions is to actually think 
not only in terms of the policies, but also the type of machinery and the type of infrastructure that is actually required to take us from point A to point B. And to be very clear and methodical in terms of actually <clears throat> deploying uh, those interventions uh, that are necessary. Um, I do sort of, uh, you know, when thinking about the economy as the basis of power, I think that's a very good point uh, to stress uh, because as long as the economy continues um, to be dynamic, it continues to grow, as long as the livelihoods of citizens continue to improve, uh, consumption goes up within society. Um, it also enables a country to put investments also in other areas that build up its basis of power. And as Professor Lin was talking about the economy as the basis of power, uh, what I thought is what are the implications uh, for US economic and military strength? Um, so if the United States with all the uh, assumptions and the and the analysis that uh, Professor Lin has given, all the way leading up to 2049, um, if the United States, and of course we know that uh, opinion polls within the US uh, relatively converge, uh, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, um, around um, China being essentially the US's uh, preeminent uh, challenger. But what I see is that we have a clash of perhaps different worldviews and different approaches to international relations. And we're living in a period where it is going to be very um, either, you know, either, you know, peaceful or a very dangerous period. Uh, based on the actions of the United States. If the United States accepts that economy is the basis of power, and on the one side, the Chinese economy um, is basically seen to be eclipsing over time the US economy, that will also have implications for the United States military strength. At the moment, the US could consider itself the preeminent military power, but it is not the preeminent economic power. And over time, as it loses um, its, 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 its economic prowess vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, let's say, China, that will also have an implication on the United States military strength. And therefore, the U.S. has a choice. Uh, it either can embark on a path towards greater cooperation and indeed um, accept what Professor Lin was saying, that a cooperative relationship is in the U.S. interest. Or it could take a very old-fashioned sort of realist um, view of the world and say that it has to try anything by, you know, within its power to disrupt China's economic, uh, um, uh, economic progress. And faced with diminishing tools to disrupt that, one of the areas it could look at, of course, is its current military strength. Having calculated that over time, that that is likely to diminish uh, as its economy is no longer uh, the uh, most important in the world. And so this is a question that I sort of, you know, what, what was circling in my mind, the implications of this idea that the economy is the basis of power and what implications it has for the actions of the US. On the one side, China is talking about win-win relations. It's talking about mutual benefits. It's talking about that as its economy continues to grow and become more resilient, it is actually in the interest of the global community to ensure that that path is not interrupted or disrupted. And so we have on the one side mutual benefits, but on the other side, we know that we have um, policymakers also in Washington, 
who, who may not necessarily subscribe to the idea of mutual benefits and who might subscribe to the idea of relative gain of, um, of, 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 of uh, sort of a zero sum game. And this could create a dangerous um, moment in global politics. Another area that I thought is, is, is quite important uh, in what uh, Professor Lin was saying is the idea of uh, domestic circulation as the mainstay of the Chinese economy. Um, we have seen throughout the period of the pandemic, uh, but also now during the conflict uh, that is taking place in Ukraine and that is involving a larger grouping of countries in the European Union and NATO, uh, we have seen that the idea of resilience has become much more important in policy circles and amongst government uh, uh, planners. And what we have, at least on the African side, I think an idea that has become more prominent is the idea of building resilience through greater regional cooperation, but also through the creation of regional value chains. Now, China has the ability, yes, on the one side to be integrated within regional and global value chains, but the idea of domestic circulation is also one of the areas where China is basically building a greater resilience. Um, in its own economy, but also in its own society. And that essentially positions China when it comes to the next uh, global pandemic or any other disturbances that may happen uh, due to conflicts or due to other, uh, um, other unforeseen events. What it guarantees is that China has a higher degree of resilience. And I think this is what we need to ask ourselves in some of the other regions of the global south, is what mechanisms are we building to become more resilient in the face of future crises, whether conflicts or pandemics. And we've already seen from an African perspective that when the pandemic came, we were found to be very, very vulnerable. We had to wait at the back of the line to access uh, protective equipment. Uh, we did not have the necessary regional value chains that would allow us to actually scale up the production of vaccines and the research that needed to actually accompany that. And so the question for us, I think for African stakeholders is how do we, I don't think, you know, we do not have the size of national economies that would be able to, let's say, adopt um, uh, a policy like that of domestic circulation. But I think ours could mirror the idea of regional value chains. And through building greater regional cooperation, through building regional value chains, that could essentially insulate us or make us more resilient in the face of future crises. And of course, we have international partners China being amongst them, um, to actually work with, to build those uh, regional value chains. A last area that I think I will touch is, um, and it also builds on the idea of technological innovation and industrial upgrading, is the opportunities that China's development path opens up for countries in the global south, but also for countries in the global north. Now, as there is greater degree of, con of domestic consumption in China, it also means that also the Chinese economy begins to open up more um, to products and services from outside of China, especially as China moves away, but does not necessarily throw out completely this export-driven uh, model uh, that has propelled uh, the economy over the past few decades. So this creates opportunities. And I think for us, uh, sitting in South Africa, sitting on other parts of the African continent, the question is whether we are equipping 
ourselves uh, to actually be at the forefront of benefiting from the various opening up measures that the Chinese economy will embark on as its domestic consumption actually grows. And so this is a question about how African countries build up their own technological innovation and also upgrade themselves industrially uh, in order to benefit from the development path that China has actually embarked on. And so uh, moderator, I think I will end my intervention there. Uh, these are just some of the comments and some of the questions that I had uh, from uh, Professor Lin's uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, um, Dr. Mtembu. And indeed you have touched on very key elements of uh, Professor Lin's uh, lecture. Um, he, he did emphasize a lot the impact of population size in the China's economic growth plans. And uh, as a country of only 60 million people, I think it matters how we integrate our economy with the rest of the African continent. And uh, those regional value chains that you have referred to are important in that regard. And maybe Professor Fiona Tregena will add to that. Uh, insofar as his outline of the new economy is concerned, he uh, flagged human capital. And uh, I want to assume that uh, this goes to the heart of investing in human capital, uh, investments that should go with the demands of human capital, the technological um, uh, skills that uh, are needed for, 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 for the human capital that will um, be the, 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 that will undergird the new economy. Uh, but he, it's also very interesting how China is willing to say that it has outlined the areas around which it doesn't have competitive advantage. And uh, it is looking for, um, for, 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 for imports of those areas, uh, namely natural resources, as well as uh, labor intensive sectors of the economy. And I think to add to your point, uh, Dr. Mtembu, this is where countries such as ourselves can zoom into these areas and develop uh, very specific plans for partnership with China around. Um, so Professor Fiona Trakena, uh, I will now call upon you to come and make your inputs. Uh, Professor Fiona is a DST and NRF South African Research Chair in Industrial Development. Uh, she's professor at the College of Business Economics in the UJ, hoping that you will also touch on um, what Professor Lin spoke about as latecomer advantages, which we may also uh, be able as a country to take um, advantage of ourselves. Uh, Professor Fiona Tregena, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Chilitsi and, and the organizers. It's an honor for me to respond uh, briefly to this profound and, and stimulating lecture by Professor Justin Yifu Lin. Um, he has, in, in a really impactful way, um, laid out uh, China's remarkable story um, of uh, sustained high growth and, and development. Uh, some people call it a miracle. Uh, I would prefer not to call it a miracle because it's, it's not something that, uh, that just happened. Um, it happened through, through agency um, and, and through choices uh, that the country made. Um, and uh, some of the aspects um, of that story uh, are the, the reconfiguration of the global economy and the, the balance of economic power, um, which he set out in, in, in figures, uh, the, the contribution to global technological advancement, and domestically, uh, the lifting of hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. China was previously uh, far poorer um, on a per capita basis uh, than South Africa. Um, as well as uh, poorer than a, a number of other African countries, just less than 50 years ago. But China sped ahead and, and overtook um, many African countries, um, including our own. And it's a change that has happened within a generation. Um, and it, it, it shows the importance of, of, of growth. Uh, we all know that growth is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. But the transformation of, of uh, people's lives literally within a generation um, is an impactful full story. 
it goes without saying uh, that countries are different and no country's model is a, is a blueprint uh, for another. And I think uh, China has also been uh, careful in, in avoiding suggesting that. There are various fundamental differences between China and South Africa and other African countries. Um, these include the far larger size of the economy um, and uh, huge differences in, in, in population. And Professor Lin has uh, shown how China's domestic uh, population uh, has been able to serve as a basis for growth um, in a way that it's not possible uh, for individual African countries. Um, although I think it, it's important again to come back to, and it's a point which uh, both uh, Pilani and uh, Chilitsi have alluded to, the continental perspective in, in that sense. Um, and it's something that I'll, I'll come back to in a few minutes. Uh, there's also differences, of course, in the political system, and we can debate uh, the extent to which uh, South Africa, uh, to which China's uh, growth and development path has been conditional on its own specific political system, which is, of course, uh, different from our own. There are also significant regional and uh, geopolitical differences, um, amongst others. Um, so, having noted uh, these and, and uh, as, as some of the the differences. I would still underscore that there are important lessons that can be drawn from any successful growth and development um, experience, um, particularly one um, of the scale and, and scope and uh, duration um, as China's, even though of course never in a, in a copy and paste manner. I think one of these is, is just as an exemplar. So showing the possibilities. Um, sometimes it's, it's easy for us in, in, in the global South to become despondent about uh, ever catching up. Uh, with advanced economies. Um, but the experience of China and early experiences, for example, of South Korea, um, show these possibilities. Um, of course, I, I have to mention industrialization. Um, I think China shows the examples um, and then the possibilities of successful industrialization um, and, and the way in which uh, industrialization and structural change can be a, a central part of, in actually driving um, a country's uh, growth and development. I think in this respect, uh, there are both uh, differences and commonalities um, from uh, some of the earlier success stories um, in, in uh, other parts of East Asia, um, in, in, including South Korea and, and other countries. So even though there are of course important differences, some of the commonalities have been an active role of the state um, even though the political systems have been different and uh, the, the nature of the role of the state has been different. Um, but there are also similarities, uh, for example, in terms of planning, um, in terms of uh, uh, driving an industrialization uh, agenda. Um, and, and the success of that industrialization makes more possible. So for a country such as China, um, having gone through such a successful and, and far-reaching industrialization uh, process, it opens up further possibilities that are not open to countries that haven't undergone uh, such an industrialization process. So, for example, the growth of um, uh, high technology and high productivity services um, in China is not something that would have been possible if China had not undergone uh, structural change and industrialization. Um, because it's, it's built uh, levels of income per capita, uh, levels of uh, productive capabilities, technological advancement that can allow a springboard for, for growth in, in other sectors. Beyond the uh, contribution of industrialization to, to China's uh, growth, I think it's evident how it's also played a, a wider transformative role um, in society, um, in modernization, urbanization, uh, transformation of uh, social relations, uh, skills development, and so on. So it's not just uh, a, a growth issue, as, as fundamental as that is, but a broader transformative role. Um, moving on to, to uh, refer to some of uh, the other aspects which uh, Professor Lin has uh, raised in his lecture, I think he's highlighted the importance of technological advancement um, as the basis for economic uh, progress. I think it's a, it's a global historical lesson um, of uh, economies around the world um, over centuries um, and something which is also underscored uh, by, by China's uh, story. Uh, I think it's, it's not possible to reach uh, sustained uh, high rates of growth over and to, to maintain those over a period of time without uh, technological advancement. 
And I think one of the lessons of uh, China's uh, story is that technological advancement is something which has happened through ongoing investments over time. So whilst there has been an element of leapfrogging, there's also been an element of just investment, um, building institutions, investment in skills and in, in technology and so on, in, in uh, incremental learning processes on a sustained basis um, over a period of, of, of time. Um, Chilizia has uh, uh, invited me to, to comment on, on the issue of latecomers advantage. Um, and I think that's particularly important uh, for our continent. Um, where many African countries are uh, not only late industrializers, but uh, late, late uh, in industrializers. And I think this opens up both uh, possibilities and, and challenges. Obviously, the uh, growth and industrialization prospects today are not the same as what they were 20, 30, uh, 50 years uh, ago. The world has changed in, in, in various ways. Um, and just to mention one aspect of this is the green transition. Um, and in some ways, um, being a latecomer does open pockets of uh, opportunities uh, for, for countries to get in um, if they are active enough. Um, on the issue of African regional integration, um, whilst uh, many of our countries, including our, our own, are, are dwarfed by China's population, but Africa as a whole has a similar population to China's, about 1.4 billion. So again, this underscores the importance of uh, regional integration um, if we are to have possibilities um, of uh, sustained growth as a continent. And I think AFCFTA has a particularly important role to play. The last uh, set of issues which I would like to talk about um, is the various ways in which uh, China's rise and the, the strength and size of, of China's economy um, has affected Africa. I think there are various uh, direct and indirect links, um, including through the Belt and Road Initiative and multiple um, public and private sector channels. One of these um, is investment from China. Um, in enterprises in African countries. Um, and I think it, it's a complex issue. Uh, we need to look at it in a nuanced way. If we look at, for example, the Ethiopian experience, we can see some of the successes um, of uh, investment from uh, Chinese firms um, in actually spurring um, and uh, accelerating industrialization um, in a low income um, African country. There are also, of course, imports from China. And I think, it's, again, it's important to take a nuanced uh, perspective to this. Uh, there's imports of final goods. There's also imports of intermediate inputs, which are often cheaper than uh, what uh, countries can access elsewhere. Um, and if used strategically, um, it's up to really countries and, and firms to look at how to capitalize on the advantages of that um, whilst building their own capabilities. Uh, there's also technological spillovers. Um, and I think, again, it, it depends on firms and, and African countries as to how to maximize the advantages of that and ensure that where there are either imports from China or investments from China in, 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 uh, within African countries, um, that they are uh, capitalizing on potential technological spillovers. Um, and my final comment will be to locate um, South Africa and uh, African countries within, um, I would say, the competitive challenge um, posed by China. I think many countries um, uh, in, in time, in, in the development process, would always try to locate themselves in the, I would say, the, the hierarchy of, of uh, competitiveness. Maybe a hierarchy suggests a, a, a two, in a two-linear way. But trying to find their place um, in the competitive uh, uh, marketplace of the world. Um, in terms of uh, technological uh, level uh, and uh, uh, productivity and uh, cost structure and so on. And I think one of the uh, things that many firms and, and countries uh, struggle to position themselves in relation to China um, is where they have both uh, lower levels um, of technological advancement um, as well as um, higher costs. And you know, it's, it's not just about unit labor costs, it's about infrastructure, it's about electricity, it's about uh, time to, to the port and so on. Um, and it's really, I think it's, it's a challenge for us. It's not something to complain about. China as in any country would maximize its own comparative um, uh, or co and competitive um, advantages. Um, and China has, uh, I think this unique combination of, of a large uh, domestic market with advanced levels of technology and competitive costs. And it's really for firms and countries in Africa to look at how to position themselves uh, relative to that, 
so that they have their own comparative um, advantage. Um, Chilitsu uh, referred to the fact uh, from, from uh, Professor Lin's lecture that China itself has identified areas where it has either weak or diminishing comparative advantage, for example, in uh, natural resource products, um, but also within manufacturing and uh, um, more labor intensive manufacturing. These are opportunities for African firms and countries. And I think it's important um, in, our, in the way that we position ourselves in the comparative advantage to take a dynamic perspective and not a static perspective to that comparative advantage. So not only looking at what we are competitive in right now, but what we can feasibly be competitive in, um, in, in the foreseeable future. Because if we stick to our, 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 our current competitive advantage, uh, it's, it's not the lesson from China and it, it probably won't take us anywhere. So it's about uh, looking at that, that, feasible, uh, that feasible jump based on a concept of uh, dynamic comparative advantage where African countries uh, can find their place uh, and, and grow. Let me leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And uh, those are, are very uh, thought-provoking interventions. Of course, our respondents didn't have the advantage of the lecture up front, but I think it is quite clear that they are well-versed with the with the topic uh, under discussion and, and some of the most in, uh, important, uh, I mean, everything that you've said is important, Fiona. I'm just uh, struck by how you are elevating further um, uh, Professor Lin's input by isolating those areas that we ourselves need to focus on, such as uh, you know, the transformative nature of China's economic growth uh, in our context is very important because we can't uh, talk economic growth without transformation. You know, the, the whole um, um, debate between economic growth and economic transformation is very important for South Africa. And, and so we, I, I welcome that uh, especially. Um, but you've also spoken about, as we reflect on lessons, we all have our unique dynamics as countries, and we have to take that into consideration. Uh, China knows its competitive advantages. Um, I want to also suggest that South Africa knows its competitive advantages, such as it's very clear the natural resources as a, an endowment that we can utilize as our competitive advantage. Mapungubye Institute has uh, uh, delved into this matter, including its work on PGM um, uh, exchange to try and give uh, uh, agency to the South African government how it needs to isolate it as a crucial competitive advantage. Um, and then, of course, we, we can't uh, complete this discussion without talking about China's uh, impact in Africa. So thank you very much for those interventions, um, Professor Trigena and uh, Dr. Pilani Mtem. I will now uh, open up for the participants who have shown interest in um, the lecture by way of comments and some questions. I hope this is not too much for you, Professor Lin, and you will continue to uh, jot down the, the inputs. Um, just a reminder to participants that you can uh, make your input through the Q&A portal that's at the bottom of the screen, uh, either your input or a question. Um, just to flag a few questions for you, Professor Lin, um, from Anonymous, thank you for the presentation. Um, what will the limiting effects of climate, climate change be on China's potential growth going forward? And then from Dr. Rajesh, Rajesh Mani, I'll just pick up a few. Um, and he says that, Thank you, Professor, for your invaluable presentation. Very important for both development policymakers and practitioners. Um, the first question is how the new dual circulation mode, uh, sorry, the new dual circulation model for Chinese economic paradigm differs from previous policies of inward looking and import substitution practiced during the so-called pre-liberalization period in developing countries. According to your perspective, how this new development model would impact on the World Trade Organization free trade agreements and regional trade agreements like BRICS? Should we take the current model of China's dual circulation as an indicator of the adverse impact on free trade agreements and globalization? 
Lastly, don't you think China's inward looking policies would have an impact on global trade in technologies and innovation practices? That's um, from Dr. Rajesh Meni. From um, Rudy Peterson, those that haven't indicated their title, please pardon me because I cannot tell, um, I, I do not know which title to use. Uh, so I'll just call out the name. From Rudy Peterson, thanks to Mistra for, and the organizers and Professor Lin for a thought provoking presentation. The comment that um, Rudy Peterson has, is GDP still the most relevant tool to quantify economic performance? And or are there other, other alternatives? And could you perhaps comment on it as you did with the one, world, one word on NDP, domestic circulation for China to demystify the use of GDP? From Eric Johnson, thank you, Prof. Appreciated your succinct articulation of the key dynamics that will drive the Chinese economy going forward. If possible, could you expand on how this economic development interplays with planetary boundaries, such as biosphere integrity, chemical flows, climate change, and freshwater usage? Um, and then from Machete Rakabe, Following Professor Lin's formulation that the economy is the fundamental basis for global power, how would he characterize contemporary China, Chinese Africa relations? Um, insofar as one, is it a development partner, a competitor only interested in short term resource grab, or a modern day colonizer aimed at displacing traditional Western influence or power? And then from Rudy Peterson again, can Professor Lin and or any panel member comment on the Denmark's alleviation to number one globally in terms of global competitiveness index and perhaps focus on the hallmarks of this um, elevation. Dr. Tami Mazwai, what extent is the current new paradigm or internal focus? Oh, sorry, I think that is not complete. So I will wait for that to be completed. To what extent is it different from China's? I think he was saying, to what extent is it different from China's previous focus on township and village economies? Is there any difference? Let me leave it at there for now in terms of the question and answer um, comments. And before I hand over to you, Prof, I will invite, I will invite Terry Shaknovsky to make um, a point. Thank you. Uh, Terry, please unmute in order to make your point. Uh, it seems there is a challenge there. In the meantime, I will hand over to you, Professor Lin, if you can please attend to uh, some of those inputs. Okay, thank you very much for the very thoughtful comments from this two discussion and also from the question from the flow. And I will not be able to cover all those questions because they touch so many dimensions. And I'll pick up the one which I think very important for us to understand my own lecture. The first one is from you know, Bilani, the first discussant. I think, and I'm delighted to see South Africa has a similar development plan as China. And certainly we can learn from each other about the strengths and the weakness of to have a national plan. And from what I see, the most important one is to make the national plan to exploit the area that the countries has the competitive advantages. And uh, with the government and you know, facilitation to turn the competitive advantages to the competitiveness of the economy by you know, removing the barriers of 
the transformation. And uh, if we can do, you know, in this way, I think the national plan will be a very important instrument to turn a country from stagnant to dynamic economic growth. And uh, by this way, you know, you can also enhance the state capacity because you know, the way to enhance the state capacity is to have success of the development. And the way to have the success of development is to follow the competitive advantage of the country. And the so-called the competitive advantage is that what you have now, what you can do well based on what you have, and then scale up what you can do well. So that's my first response to Finani's you know, uh, 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 observations. And secondly, regarding the relation between China and the US, certainly the most important concern for China is how to improve the defense of the Chinese people. And for increasing, you know, improving the defense of the Chinese people, we need to develop our economy further. And I mentioned the best way to develop the economy is to follow the competitive advantage of the country. And for that, certainly, you know, we have to embrace the globalization. And China will continue to you know, be a champion for the globalization. China will continue to be a good student of WTO. China joined the WTO in 2001. And certainly China made you know, many promises commitment for an accession to the WTO. According to the former WTO general manager, uh, 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 you know, the chairman, that China was A plus students of the WTO because China honored all the commitment, you know, when China accept accession to the WTO. But as you know, now US has some ideas of changing the rule of the WTO because China has been so successful within the framework of the WTO, uh, within the, uh, the framework of globalization. But for this, I hope US first will honor its words, its teaching to a student like me who were educated in the US. When I was young, I believed in the world that I was taught by the teacher, by the intellectuals from the US. For example, development is a human right. And I concede, I hope US will continue to honor the teaching. Development is a human right, not only for the US. Development is a human right for all the human beings in the world including in China, in Africa, in South Africa. And secondly, when I was young, I was taught, Chui is a win-win. And uh, from what I, my study show, Chui certainly is a win-win. And I hope that US will continue to honor free trade is a win-win for everyone in the world, not only China, but also for the US. And also hope, U.S. policy will care about the benefit of its people, not the benefit of its military industry complex. They seem to be captured. If they are captured, I think it's not only not good for China, but also not good for the U.S. people, certainly also people in the world. And. Uh, and uh, finally, you mentioned that U.S. Is certainly now is the superpower in, you know, in terms of military capacity. Yes, U.S. has the capacity to destroy the world 10 times. But at the same time, China is also a military power. And especially, you know, China doesn't have intention to invade other countries, but China has the ability to defend its own territory. Because in the, in the Pacific Rim, 
I think China has a regional superiority over the US in the cost area of China. So I hope, you know, the US will really, you know, understand, you know, its responsibility for its own people and for the peace in the world. And now regarding the Fiona, you know, comments, and I agree, the growth in China in the past four decades certainly is remarkable, but it's not a miracle. It can be explained, you know, because basically China follow what I say, the competitive advantages of the Chinese economy. And with the, you know, effort of the people and the facilitation of the government, turn those kind of advantages into competitiveness. I think every country can do that if they follow this kind of principle. You know, looking at what you have now, not on what other people have. Look at what you have now. And based on what you have, you can do well. Then scale up what you can deliver by the business cycle with the support of the government. If you can do that, every country can you know, grow as dynamically as China did in the past decade. That's what I, you know, the, the message in the last pages of my book, The Quest for Prosperity. And also, you are right. It's very important to have example, to have some country to be successful, to be example. You know, Asian country was lucky to have Japan as the first industrialized country outside the West. And it provide the example and aspiration for the East Asian. And China also benefits from the successful example of Korea, Taiwan, China, and Singapore. Because if they could do well, certainly Vietnam and China should be able to do well. And I think that I also hope in an African country, hopefully South Asia, will be the successful example for the whole continent. And as I said, every country, if they follow their competitive advantages based on what they have now and, uh, and uh, can do well based on what they have and the scale of that, every country can be growing dynamically. And in this process, you are right. Certainly, we should have a confidence on the markets. But at the same time, we need to have an active government to facilitate that because we can see market values, failures everywhere. For example, if you want to turn the sector of which you have competitive advantages into globally competitive, you need to improve the infrastructure. But we can see the infrastructure bottlenecks in almost every developing country. But to improve the infrastructure, the private sectors will not be able to do that. We need to have a state to do that. You know. And I think China is an opportunity for Africa. Because China does not have territorial ambition. And China does not have you know, the, 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 the ambition to you know, dominate any country. Because historically, you know, China has been a civilization, the, uh, you know, a, a civilization in the world. And China never invade other country, you know. You know, even in the 13th, 14th century, you know, China was the dominating power. And uh, I like to, you know, have one, you know, uh, 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 side of one comments by former prime minister of, of, of Malaysia, Mahathir. He was warned the rising power of China, you know, and what's the implication for Malaysia? And the Mahathir said, well, China has been the most powerful neighbors for us for more than 2000 years, but we are always neighbors. And when the West came to visit us within two years, we were colonized. So that's the difference. And I think that can also be uh, a good description of 
the relation between China and Africa. Yes, China become more importantly economically. And certainly, as I mentioned, China is a resources poor country. And uh, many African countries are resources abundant country. It does not mean that China will go to Africa to grasp the resources like the colonial power in the past. They came to Africa and they colonized and they took over the resources without paying anything. As China now need to have resources, but basically China import those resources and are paying the prices according to the global markets. And because the rising needs of the Chinese you know, demand for resources, and we can see the resources prices increase so much. And that is one of the major reasons for the resources abundant country to have good trade surplus because of the rising demand of China. So basically, you know, I think the rights of China is an opportunity for Africa. And uh, regarding the issue of climate change, certainly it's a challenge to every country in the world. And the way to cope the to cope with the the, the climate change is to green our economy. And uh, during the industrialization, we need to have green industrialization. And uh, in the development, we need to have the green development. China treats that as a challenge, but also as an opportunity. And uh, so China invests a lot to develop its green sectors. And one example is the electronic cars. Because China see, you know, if we want to cope with the climate change, reduce the CO2 emission, we need to replace the diesel engine car with electronic car. And so China invests a lot in the electronic car production and so on. And currently, you know, China produce about half of the electronic car in the world. So for the climate change, yes, it's a challenge, but we can turn that challenge into an opportunity. And now China become a leaders in the green technology in green sector in the world. And certainly those kind of technology can also be you know, shared with other country in the world. So it will also benefit other country from China's new development in the green technology. Then the dual circulation. As I mentioned, dual circulation, the first part, to have domestic circulation as a main state, as a main state, it's just a reflection of a reality. It does not mean China turn into an inward looking country. As I mentioned, if China want to make the domestic circulation to increase from currently about 82% of China's GDP up to 85 or 30 or 90% of China's GDP. China has to further develop the Chinese economy. And the best way to further develop the Chinese economy is to follow the competitive advantage of the Chinese economy. You know, develop those sector, China has a competitive advantage and export those goods to the global market. And in sector where China does not have the competitive advantages, China should import the product or technology from other country, including advanced country or other middle income country or low income country. And so that's the second part of new, the dual circulation strategy. That is to have the domestic circulation and overseas circulation to further reinforce each other. So-called to use the domestic circulation to reinforce the overseas circulation that when China grow, domestic market will become larger. Certainly China will import more. But at the same time, you know, if China want to you know, further develop its economy, China also need to import more from the global economy. So I think it's a misunderstanding to think that 
the device circulation strategies, what we have a domestic circulation in the main state is, you know, it, it, it is a, you know, a change in China's policy. Actually, it's not a change. That from an economy that follow the competitive advantage to, you know, push the development of the economy into an inward looking country. If China turn into an inward looking country, it will be a recipe for failure as China you know, experienced in, you know, in the past before 1978 and also as other country experienced after the Second World War. Inward looking strategies is a recipe for failure and China will abort them. And, and I also respond to the relation between China and Africa. I think that we have opportunity to join hands to pursue our development. If every country follow the competitive advantages, then in a certain way, will be a bridge for us to join in for further development in our country. And regarding the global competitiveness index, or doing business index or global governance and so on. For those kind of index, they always use the advanced country as the standards. But if we look into those kind of practice or institution or policy good for the advanced country may not be suitable for the developing country. So as you can see in the past, you know, several decades, those developing country doing well, they basically did not do well in all those kind of, you know, indicators, including global competitive, you know, indicators or doing business indicators or the world governance indicators. Successful country, successful advanced country, they always have very high, you know, marks on those kind of indicators. And I do not mean that to have a poor indicators, you know, is a recipe for success. But we can see those very dynamic growing country, including China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and so on. You know, in general, in the catching up process, their indicators were not high. And some other developing country, they try to reform their economy or their country according to the indicators. But in general, they improve the indicators, but they do not improve their economic performance. I think the main reason is that country is a different stage of development. What are good institutions, what are good structure for their economies will be different from country at different stage of development. That is the main lessons uh, in my new structural economics. And that's the reason why I try to propose new school of thought that the new structural economics. And I would like to recommend you to read my book, for example, The Quest for Prosperity was between the arts and those are popular readers reading uh, popular books. Uh, uh, trade books. You can also to read some you know, more academic articles uh, by myself. For example, the New Structure Economics is a collective volume I published at the World Bank when I was the chief economist of the World Bank. Then coming to the issue of township and village enterprises, it was quite popular, quite important in the 1980s, 1990s. At that time, China was still an economy with all kinds of shortages. And township and village enterprises feel the market needs at that time. But basically now all the township and village enterprises disappeared, replaced by the private business, private enterprises. So, you know, the township and village enterprises was a driving force in the 1980s, 1990s. At that time, the township and village enterprises contribute to about one third of China's you know, uh, 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 export growth and so on. But now they are all replaced by the private sectors. 
And the private sector in 1978 was almost zero. Now the private sector has contribute, contributed about 75% of China's GDP. So although the disappearing of township and rich enterprises does not mean that the right, uh, 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 you know, the, it, it was uh, uh, the, the the declining, uh, uh, the, th uh, the importance of township and rich enterprises was, you know, reflect in the time of 1980s and 1990s, but actually it's a past history now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Um, we have just a few minutes, which oh, I don't see the the question from Professor Villincomo. Um, in this last few minutes, uh, I think there are questions on the Q&A that are interested in your view regarding um, South Africa in particular. I think you have made a general um, observation that any country that focuses on its competitive advantage is going to succeed with uh, its economic growth. Uh, but I think perhaps in this last few minutes, uh, your view about what uh, South Africa could focus on in particular, I'm sure you have a, a bit, you have knowledge of our country and uh, taking lessons uh, from the Chinese experience and its own plans going into the future. Well, I thank you very much for uh, trying to have my advice about South Africa. I think it's a country with great, great potential. Certainly, resources is one of your competitive advantages. Young population is one of your competitive advantages. Good education, good human capitals is also your competitive advantages. And economic size is also your competitive advantages. And uh, all those are your competitive advantages. Certainly, as I mentioned, if you want to develop your economy according to your competitive advantages, on the one hand, you need to have effective markets and allow the entrepreneur to function in the market. But at the same time, every country has so many you know, uh, uh, barrier so many bottlenecks. Some are in the hard infrastructure, and I and some are in the you know institutions. But for South Africa, from what I see, that hard infrastructure is a mining country. Power supply, raw networks, port facilities. You know, certainly compared to other you know low income African country. South Africa is more advanced, but compared to what you need for turning your competitive advantages into competitive advantages, I think as there are still many barriers for Africa to remove. And for that, I think to have a facilitation state, it's very important. And secondly, it's the institutions. I think that you know, on the one hand, South Africa inherit the you know, institutions, social political institutions from the you know, Britain. But some of the institution may be suitable for advanced country like Britain, but may not be so suitable for Africa. So uh, South Africa. So I think you also need to find a way, in an innovative way, to make your institution that facilitate, you know, turning those complete advantages into your strengths. If you can do that, I think every country will have the hope, as I said, to grow dynamically for several decades and to turn the country from low income or middle income to high income. And like Fiona observed, in 1978, when China started a transition from a planned economy to a market economy, at that time, the per capita GDP in China was 
156. It was less than one third of the average in sub-Saharan African country. In 1978, the per GDP in sub-Saharan African country was 490 US dollars and China was 156. And last year, the per capita GDP in China was 12,551. And I think uh, very likely within a few years, China will become a high income country. And so China, you know, within my lifetime, moved from one of the lowest income country. According to the World Bank, in 1978, China was third poorest country in the whole world. The third poor, poorest country in the whole world. And uh, China is likely to be a high income country by the time of 2025, you know. So I think it's possible to change the destiny of a country if the policy is right. And how uh, Africa, South Africa, will have the right policy, five framework to be you know, a successful example, not only for the people of South Africa, but also for the people in Africa. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Those are, are, are I think, very important uh, sort of closing words. Um, every country has a possibility um, to, to, to become prosperous and China has shown us that um, I would now like, I mean, there are many other questions that were posted. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them. Um, and as I have said, the lecture is available on the YouTube platform, Mistra South Africa, for those that would like to delve deeper into it once more. Um, but we would like really to take this opportunity um, to thank you and the respondents for uh, inciting us with um, uh, your views and uh, 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 inputs on China and where it is going and what we can borrow from that as lessons for South Africa. I will, I will now call upon the executive director for MISTRA, um, Mr. Joel Nashitenje, to give some closing remarks. Thank you, program director. I should say that uh, identifying the speaker for this year's event was a simple task. The world is slowly but surely emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, but of course major challenges remain. In spite of the difficulties, including the war in Eastern Europe, there is confidence that the global economy will gradually resume higher rates of growth. And of course, one of the foremost locomotives of global growth is China, the world's second largest economy, and of course the largest as we had if we use purchasing power parity. And so developments in the Chinese economy are of interest to the rest of the world, including South Africa and the rest of our continent. Given today's uh, geoeconomic and geopolitical dynamics, the question has arisen whether the Chinese economy will resume its recent trend growth. With the growing use of sanctions as an instrument of technological, financial, trade and political competition, what then would be the drivers of Chinese growth. With the much heralded attempts at reshoring, nearshoring, and friendshoring of production chains, are China's domestic drivers of growth sufficient to sustain its development efforts? 
Is domestic consumption growing at the desired pace? And what impact would such factors have on the growth of the economy? And these factors would include the high savings rate, the magnitude of social protection, and the demographic changes that are currently underway. And now we'll all agree that uh, Professor Justin Lin has competently addressed these issues and that the engagement was indeed a truly enlightening toward the force. So thank you very much, Professor Lin, for agreeing to present the 2022 Mapungubwe Annual Lecture, our 10th and for explaining issues that many of us get in a somewhat distorted form, interpreted from the point of view of those who now characterize China as a strategic competitor or even enemy, and who seem deliberately to want to constrain China's rise. Today's hegemons, seem bent even on provocation and confrontation in order to stop the change in global economic power balances. And in my view, herein lies the danger to humanity. Firstly, a decoupling that would take global society backwards. But secondly, in what seems to be a willingness to use stratagems that may precipitate even physical confrontation. For us in South Africa and indeed the continent at large, relevant lessons from China will always stand us in good stead. The relationships that advance our development will always be nurtured. And the differences that arise will always be managed for mutual benefit. The Mapungubwe Annual Lecture is organized in partnership with the University of Johannesburg. And we once again wish to thank them for their commitment to this relationship. We also wish to express our gratitude to the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences who joined us in this year's arrangement. Our thanks also go to the respondents, Professor Pilanim Tembu, Professor Tregena, and so on, who have helped to identify the similarities and contrasts between China and our own region and identify relevant lessons. Our gratitude to Dr. Chilizi Rajtanga, who I think we will all agree was an engaged and yet impartial manager of today's program. We also wish to thank the MISTRA and UJ task team, whose work behind the scenes made today's event a success. To all the participants, the majority of whom have stayed until now, your engagement of the issues and your cooperation have made today's event a success. We hope to see you not only at next year's uh, Mapungubwe lecture, but in the many other engagements organized by MISTRA and its partners, hopefully without the complications of virtual arrangements and the disruptions of load shedding. So thank you very much to Professor Lin and thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Nechitanja. Let's take the opportunity to also thank you for those um, remarks. 
And uh, once again, all the our 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 guests, including our guest of honor, uh, Professor Justin Lin. And uh, this brings to the end uh, this tenth um, annual lecture of Mistra, and we hope that Mistra will continue to grow and will continue to enlighten us with these uh, important lectures, as well as all the other events that it organizes for uh, our intellectual benefit. Thank you very much to the organizers for the uh, virtual uh, session. And this brings to a close the lecture for this year, 2022. Mapungubye Institute for Strategic Reflections, 10th year anniversary. Thank you and goodbye.